Good morning, church family, and welcome in the name of Jesus Christ to our worship celebration. I invite you all for refreshments and fellowship in the Lord Hall after the service. The Sacrament of Holy Communion will be celebrated this morning, and all are invited to the Lord's table. Today is recognized as Presbyterian World Service and Development Sunday within the Presbyterian Church in Canada. This relief agency works with partners overseas and Canadians here at home to make positive changes in our world. So if you would like to support the good work they do, please use the special offering envelope inserted in the bulletin today. And uh, we just give you thanks for helping to make a difference in this world. Session will meet virtually tomorrow evening, Monday the 5th at 7 p.m. So please pray for the elders as we discern the best provision for our church. A Ash Wednesday service will be held February 14th at 6.30 p.m. So invite someone to join you as a special service as we begin the season of Lent. It was with great sadness we received the news that Dom Tromboli passed suddenly on Tuesday, January 30th. Dom joined Clarity Park in 2019, having served at Knox Spadine, a Presbyterian church, for many years. Visitation will be held at Highland Funeral Home, which is Shepherd and Warden area, on Tuesday 6, at 6, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. and Wednesday at 10 a.m., followed by the service at 11 o'clock, officiated by our pastor. So please continue to keep Marie, Kim, and the entire family in prayer at this very sorrowful time. These are all the announcements. Thank you. Well, friends, we're here to worship the Lord together on this Communion Sunday. Stand if you're able and let's sing Holy, Holy, Holy.
come to the Lord in prayer now, offering Him our praise and our thanks and acknowledging our sins. Let's pray. Blessed are you, Sovereign God, Creator of all, to you be glory and praise forever. God, you are our help in ages past. You are our hope for years to come. You founded the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. In the fullness of time, you, you made us in your image. And in these last days, you have spoken to us in your Son, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. As we rejoice in the gift of your presence among us, let the light of your love always shine in our hearts. Your spirit ever renew our lives. Your praises always be on our lips. Blessed be you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit forever. Lord, in your word in the book of Romans, it says that all of us have sinned and fallen short of your glory, yet we are justified by the gift of your grace through redemption that it's ours in Jesus Christ. Lord, we trust in your mercy, and because of that, we would confess our sin to you now. Let's pray our prayer of confession. Holy and merciful God, you always keep your promises. In our prayers and songs, we say that we want to be Christians. But so often we forget our promises. Our actions do not match up with our words. We say mean things to other people. We hurt their feelings. We think of ourselves first. And worst of all, we ignore you. Lord, forgive our sins and help us to live in your light and walk in your ways for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Dear friends, hear the good news. Our righteousness, our right standing, our relationship with God is found in Christ alone, a gift of God by faith. Beloved people of God, believe the good news. Through the grace of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Scripture says, be kind to one another and tender-hearted, forgiving each other as God in Christ has forgiven you. So in that spirit, I want to invite you to greet one another in the peace of Christ the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Now would you extend that peace to each other. Say hello to your neighbor in Jesus' name. Peace to you, online church family. The hymn is number 498, Sing Them Over Again to Me. <laughs>
be seated and children, could you come up and join Rev Kev? I'll try to read this nice and loud so even the adults can hear it too, but a little birdie told me that you guys are going to learn one of the most exciting stories in the whole Bible in Sunday school this morning. And it's about a boy who wasn't too much bigger than you guys who did something amazing when someone really big who was threatening God's people came. And the story is David and Goliath. Do you know that story? You do? Do you know that story? Well, here it is. You don't know it, Jacob? Well, we're going to know it now. You're going to know it after Sunday school. King Saul and his army looked out from their mountain hideout. Their enemies, the Philistines, were camped on the other mountain opposite them. In the valley between stood Goliath, the tallest man Saul had ever seen. Who will fight me, Goliath roared, waving his spear. Who can fight the mighty Goliath, he shouted, lifting up his sword. Saul and his armies, how do you think they felt? They were, yeah. They were scared. They were afraid. They couldn't win against the Philistines. Nobody could beat Goliath. Surely they'd be captured and become slaves. A beam of sunlight bounced off of Goliath's bronze helmet. His voice shook the leaves in the trees. All the birds hid behind their branches. Send out your best warrior, Goliath ordered. Let him fight against me. If I win, you'll be our slaves. If your soldier wins, we will serve you and your God. King Saul waited. Nobody wanted to take up Goliath's challenge. Saul felt a small tug on his sleeve, and looking down, look, he saw David. You see little David? He was just a kid, just a teenager. Looking down, he saw David. I'll do it, David said. I'll fight Goliath. Yeah, well, David, and, 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 and you know what King Saul said? Saul said, you're just a boy. How can you beat a gigantic man like Goliath? And Saul turned to go. Wait, wait, King Saul, David said. God protects me from the wolves and bears that I go, that go after my sheep. I'm a shepherd. God will protect me now, too. Wow, well, look. Look, kids. That's Goliath laughing. Know this song? There's a song about it. Yes, I know. Yes. <laughs> David reached down and picked up five little rocks, some smooth stones. In his right hand, he carried the same sling he used to chase away the wolves and wild animals. Saul patted David's head and pointed down the rocky path leading to the valley. Goliath laughed when he saw David. You're the warrior they sent against me? David slipped his hand into his pouch and selected one of the stones. I'm not afraid of your spear and, and sword, Goliath, David said. God will help me. David rushed toward Goliath, swinging his sling, and the smooth stone fell, flew through the air. And guess what? It hit Goliath where? Right in the forehead. Uh, look, down, 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 Goliath fell. Down fell his sword, down fell his spear, down fell his mighty shield. David picked up Goliath's helmet from the ground and he held it up high in the air. Saul and all the soldiers rose up with a shout and cheered for David, the small shepherd boy who had beaten the mighty warrior Goliath. And when the Philistines saw that Goliath had fallen, they were afraid and they ran away. <coughs> Trusting in God gave David the courage when he needed it most. 
wow, what an amazing story. I understand you guys are going to have crafts and activities today. I wish I could be in Sunday school sort of this morning with you. But that's an amazing story because it shows that even though the enemy Goliath was big and strong and scary, David knew that his God was more powerful even than Goliath than the enemy he was facing. And he trusted God, and God helped David win. Mm -hmm. <coughs> David did what? Yeah, that's true. So let's pray, children. <laughs> Lord, thank you for these stories that are exciting, but more than that, they show us your power and the way that you can rescue and redeem and help us when we call out to you because you are the God of all strength and power, even when we're feeling weak. Bless these precious children. Let them have a lot of fun and learn a lot about you and your word in Sunday school now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Good morning, church family. Good morning. The responsive reading is taken from Psalms 130, which is found on 635 in the Pew Bible and 970 in the large print. <coughs> Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O oh Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who can stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. More than those who watch for the Lord. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is a great is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Good morning, church family. Good morning. Uh, the scripture reading today will be from Mark chapter 5, verses 21 to 43. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue, named Jairus, came. And when he saw him, fell at his feet, and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well. Be made well and live, sorry. So he went with him, and a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for twelve years. She had endured much under many phys physicians and had spent all she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately after, her hemorrhages stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, Who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him, and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, 
some people came from the leader's house to say, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha come, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. This is the word of the Lord.
Well, the message is titled today is Jesus and the Two Daughters. Okay, friends, here's the situation. What would you do? Put on your thinking caps. The phone rings. You hear the doorbell go ding dong. Your kid calls for help. And the oven alarm goes off. All at the same moment. What do you do? Turn to your neighbor and tell them what you do. Ding dong. Ring ring. Mom! <laughs> beep beep. Some of you said I'd do this. <laughs> That's kind of like the situation that Jesus was facing as he embarked on another busy day of ministry in Galilee. Not all, all the people were there pressing for his attention, but Mark chooses to record two of them that got through. These two stories Jonah just read for us are connected to each other. Both deal with women who were treated honestly like second-class citizens in their culture. Both are spiritually unclean according to the customs of their day. Both are in what looks to be hopeless situations, one with a chronic disease, the other facing death. And both are healed by the touch of Jesus. But there's also some obvious differences between Jairus and his little girl and that unnamed woman in the crowd. Even though they lived in the same area, their lives could not have been more different from one another, socially, religiously, economically. The only thing that unites them is their shared need for God's help and faith that Jesus can help them. Jesus has just come back on a boat from the the, to the west side of the Sea of Galilee. He's back into Gentile territory where his reputation has been growing. That's why the crowds surround him as soon as he gets off the boat. Hey, Jesus is here. Jesus has come back. Let's go see Jesus. And working his way through that swarm of people comes one of the local synagogue leaders, a man named Jairus. Now remember that the center of the Jewish faith was in Jerusalem. That's where the temple was. That's where daily sacrifices and prayers to God were made. And where the Jewish priests and religious leaders lived. But in every town and village where Jews, Jewish people had settled, you'd find, you'd find a synagogue, a, a local congregation, a place where the faithful would go every Sabbath for worship and instruction and prayers, just like our Jewish friends do to this day. These local synagogues were run by a group of lay leaders, like our elders, and Jairus was apparently one of these leaders. But now this respected community religious leader does something very surprising and undignified for a man of his position. He throws himself down at Jesus' feet, and he begs Jesus to come heal his daughter. He's heard about Jesus' ability to heal. And the fact that he was willing to, to risk public ridicule shows how desperate he was. Jairus is quite a contrast to some of the other religious leaders we've met in Mark's Gospel. Jairus is humble, He's full of faith, and he readily admits his need. You know, if you're a parent, you know you'd do anything to help your child. And here Jairus comes, not as an elder, as a leader, but as a distraught dad, who braves the indignity of looking foolish to his neighbors by seeking help for his little girl. He comes to Jesus because everything else has failed. What does he ask Jesus? He says, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come, come and lay your hands on her so that she may be, may be made well and live. Now the act of laying on hands was a common Jewish practice, particularly when leaders would be ordained for service. 
but it was also done as an act of blessing and when praying for someone's healing. Jairus had a precious 12-year-old daughter who was gravely ill, and there's an extreme urgency about the situation. So the scripture says, so Jesus went with him. Hearing the cry of this anxious parent for his child, Jesus responds immediately, and he starts out for the man's house. But then, something unexpected happens. The crowds are crushing in, they're surrounding him. Can you just imagine the, the dust and the noise and the push and the pull? And Jairus is walking briskly in front of him, urging him on, hurry up, Lord, come, teacher, this way. We got no time to lose. And suddenly, Jairus, uh, Jesus isn't there. <laughs> Jairus looks back <laughs> and he sees Jesus has stopped and he's talking to a woman. And he overhears Jesus saying, hey, who touched me? And the disciples say to him, what? <laughs> you see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, who touched me? Everybody's touching you. Now, friends, if you were in Jairus, this young daughter's dad's shoes, how would you feel about Jesus stopping? Panicky? perturbed, angry. Jesus is wasting precious time talking to this woman when Jairus knows the urgency of his daughter's condition. And during the delay, some friends arrive with the worst news. Jairus, your daughter just died. It's too late. At that moment, how do you think Jairus felt? How would you have felt if, if you were in his shoes? If, if only Jesus hadn't stopped. If only we kept going. We, we could have gotten there in time. Does Jesus even care? It felt like Jesus was ignoring this man's faith. Remember when the storm rose up as Jesus and the disciples were in the boat together, what we talked about last week, and they had to wake Jesus up? He was sleeping in the middle of the storm, and they shook him awake, and they said, Lord, don't you care if we're perishing? <sighs> Jairus probably felt something like that. Dearly beloved, does Jesus care when someone we love is sick? He cared enough to go with Jairus in the first place, but then inexplicably, Jesus stopped. He ignored Jairus, or, or at least that's how it seemed that moment. And I wonder, friends, have you ever felt like that? You ever felt like Jesus was, was ignoring you? He'd stopped and started to deal with other people, but not the need that you're facing, the crisis in your life? That's a painful place to be in, isn't it? Jairus' friends tell him, don't bother Jesus the teacher now. But they were thinking, Jairus, don't make a fool of yourself. It's too late. And you were a fool to have gone to Jesus in the first place. Sometimes in life, it seems like Jesus is ignoring your faith. But that's not the end of the story. But interrupting this drama, along comes another person in great need. And look how Jesus responds to her. A poor woman from the same village as Jairus had been suffering from a flow of blood for 12 long years some sort of gynecological disorder and hemorrhaging from her womb, and she'd spent all her savings seeking cures from doctors, but to no avail. After all that time, after all that money, her condition was worse. And the nature of her illness was not only physically debilitating and embarrassing, it was profoundly alienating. 
The nature of her illness made her ritually, according to the Jewish law, unclean. In Leviticus chapter 15, meaning no one should come near to her. It would make them unclean if they got too close to her. This poor woman was suffering not only physically, she was being ostracized, cut off from the community of her own people, excluded from ordinary human contact, being told at the door of the synagogue, you can't come in here. She wasn't even allowed in church. How isolated she must have felt. But this woman had heard about Jesus somehow, his power to heal, so with fear and trepidation, but also with courage and with faith, she comes up behind Jesus and she just touches his cloak, his, his outer clothing. And immediately she knows she's been healed. She can feel it deep inside. Now friends, this isn't superstition. This isn't magic. This is the power of faith. She knew in her heart that, that any contact with Jesus, however slight, could bring healing, and so it did. But notice, Jesus doesn't say, daughter, your touch has healed you. What did Jesus say to her? Daughter, your faith has healed you, has made you well. But what's fascinating isn't just the woman's healing, but how Jesus reacts to her healing. Another version of the Bible says, Jesus realized at once that the healing power had gone out from him, so he turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my robe? Power had gone out of him. That same mysterious power of God that had been at work over the storm and over the demons, now it flowed out of Jesus again. Understandably, the disciples don't get it. They rebuke Jesus just like before in the boat. What do you mean, Lord? We're, we're jammed in here with this crowd of people, this swarm, and, and you want to know who touched you? Anybody. Everybody's touching you. Now that poor woman must have been terrified when Jesus looked around to see who had done it. Who, who touched me? How do you think she felt when she heard that, what she thought, accusing question? Her act of faith had been done secretly. She just came up behind and touched the garment. But now she's about to be exposed in front of everybody. And trembling in fear, she fell down before Jesus. Just like Jairus did, the very same words. She fell down and told Jesus the whole truth. She was breaking so many social and religious rules by going into the crowd and by touching Jesus, a rabbi. And now she'd made Jesus and the people in the crowd unclean as well. Surely, Rabbi Jesus would rake her over the coals for doing what she'd just done. <laughs> but no, look how Jesus responds. Daughter, he says, daughter. What an affectionate way to greet a fellow Hebrew, highly highlighting that she too was a child of Abraham and now a member of Jesus' new family. Daughter, he says, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Be freed from your suffering. In other words, her healing has come because of her faith. In Greek, did you know the word for healing and salvation is the same root word as sozo? And her faith resulted in both her healing and her salvation. Her body is now well, and she's been restored to normal life in the community, too. Jesus makes it publicly known that she has been healed in the hearing of the ears of everybody in the crowd so that everyone would know that this woman has not only been healed physically, but has been brought back into the community again. What a story this is. What a re revelation of the character of Jesus. He was willing to break the rules, to defile himself, to make himself unclean, 
and risk rejection by the religious leaders for this poor woman's sake. Earlier in his ministry, Jesus had healed an outcast leper by touching him. And he would soon reveal the true power of God's kingdom by suffering with sacrificial love on the cross to bring healing and cleansing and salvation to every one of us who by right deserve God's judgment. Now friends, to be honest, this story causes me to think about the way I react to interruptions compared to Jesus. Oops. <laughs> There's no hint Jesus is annoyed when this anonymous woman delays his work for an important man in the community. He embraces the moment and helps this woman in her time of need. Do we act that way? When the phone rings and the demands come our way and we're interrupted from the plans we've made? Maybe some of those interruptions that come our way, the interruptions that often disturb us, come from God. They're God-given opportunities to reach out to others and share Christ's love. That's what Jesus did. Do we do that? But now let's go back to the story of Jairus and his sick daughter. While Jesus is interacting with the woman in the crowd, Jairus receives the devastating news that his little girl has died. And so Jesus' help isn't needed anymore. Jesus might be able to heal some sick people, but nobody could think that he could do anything about his little girl's condition now. Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any longer? But ignoring them, Jesus says to Jairus words that every one of us need to hear. Do not be afraid, only believe. Arriving at Jairus' house, Jesus and the disciples find a crowd of mourners who are weeping and wailing loudly. And then Jesus says something that sounds audacious and insensitive. Why all this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead, she's sleeping. And they laughed at him. I mean, if you'd been there, wouldn't you? Or maybe thought a few choice thoughts that you'd like to say to that guy? Disturbed by his insensitivity to this situation? Only Peter, James, and John and the girl's parents were allowed to witness what Jesus was about to do. Making everybody else leave, Jesus and the others enter the room where the child was, lifeless and unmoving. And reaching down, he gently takes her by the hand and he speaks life back into her body. The power of God. Talitha kum. Which literally means little lamb, little girl. Get up. Little lamb. Wake up. And immediately, her eyes opened and she stood up and she walked around and her, her eyes were shining and her, her arms were reaching out to her parents, able to eat and play and walk and live again. Jesus had just raised someone from the dead in the ultimate demonstration of his authority and power. And they were overwhelmed and amazed, just like all of us would be. You see, friends, the gospel writer Mark has been showing us all along in his gospel that Jesus is the vehicle and the focal point of God's power. He's reminding us of what he claimed way back in the first verse in Mark chapter 1, verse 1, when it said, Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. Not only is Jesus a wise spiritual teacher, but someone who acts with the very authority and power of God. Jesus demonstrated God's power over the natural order when he stills the storm on the Sea of Galilee. He demonstrated God's power in the spiritual world when he heals people possessed by demons. And now he demonstrates God's power by healing a chronically sick woman and raising a little girl back to life. Jesus is Lord 
over every situation. Over nature, over the spiritual world, over sickness, even over death itself. Amidst the problems and the trouble and perplex and discourage us, Jesus says, Jesus says to you and to me what he says to Jairus. Don't be afraid. Only believe. Will we do that? Will you do that? Will you believe? As we approach the Lord's table this morning, will you put your trust in Him for your life, your situation, your loved ones, your questions, your struggles, your doubts, your fears, your hopes, your dreams? Don't be afraid. Just believe in me. His love and His power are deeper than we can ever imagine. Amen. Lord Jesus, thank you that it is by faith that we encounter you. Lord, increase our faith. Help us to trust. When our doubts or our fears or situations in our lives threaten to overwhelm or undo us, Help us to keep on believing in you, trusting in you, knowing that your love for us is stronger and deeper and wider than we can ever imagine. Amen. Especially on Communion Sundays, it's the tradition in many churches to repeat one of the creeds, what we believe as Christians uh, as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. So can I invite you now to turn in your hymn books to number 578. And this contains the words of the Nicene Creed. It's another one of the ancient creeds of the Christian church, like the Apostles' Creed. It's a little longer but it expresses what Christians have believed down through the centuries. Let's read it prayerfully together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and life of the world to come. Amen. The scriptures say, give as you have made up your mind to, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. 
Let's lift up our offerings to the Lord as we stand and sing the doxology. that bears with us your love that has saved us. Help us to love you and to be thankful for all your gifts by serving you and delighting to do your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into them and will eat with them and they with me. This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites all those who believe in and trust him to share the feast that he's prepared. As our hymn of invitation, and especially remembering that this is Black History Month, let's sing the great, the, the great African American spiritual. Let us break bread together. <laughs> Shed for you 
for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of the Lord until he comes. Let's offer God our grateful praise. And the words of response are in the hymn book number 564, if you need to, to see them. The Lord be with you. And Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. Blessed are you, O God of the universe. Your mercy is everlasting. Your faithfulness endures forever. Praise to you for creating the heavens and the earth. Praise to you for saving the earth from the waters of the flood. Praise to you for bringing the Israelites safely through the sea. Praise to you for leading your people through the wilderness to the land of milk and honey. Praise to you for the words and actions of Jesus, your anointed Messiah. Praise to you for the death and resurrection of Christ. Praise to you for your spirit poured out on all peoples and nations. For all these things we praise you, joining our voices to the whole company of heaven who sing together, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Praise to you for the gift of this holy supper. With this bread and this cup, we remember our Lord's Passover from death to life as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. O God of resurrection, pour out your spirit on us and these gifts of bread and wine. Bless this feast. Grace our table with your presence. Reveal yourself to us when we break the bread. Raise us up as the body of Christ for the world. Breathe new life into us and send us forth burning with justice, peace, and love. God of grace, we pray for your church today around the world and our own congregation that we may worship and serve you faithfully for leaders and people in every land, that they may know your way and do your will. For justice throughout our suffering, war-torn world, that there may be peace and plenty for all. For the earth you have made, that it may flourish again in beauty and show your glory. For all who are hungry or thirsty, that they may be filled with good things, and especially today, Lord, for the work of Presbyterian world service and development. For those who are ill or in hospital, who need your loving touch and care. For Tom Armstrong. For Denora Herman. For the Tromboli and Nemeth families as they mourn the loss of John. Surround them all with your peace. With all your holy ones in all times and places. With the earth and all its creatures. With the sun and moon and stars. We praise you, O Lord. Blessed and holy Trinity, now and forever. And as our Savior Jesus taught us, we are bold to pray, singing together. <laughs> Yeah. 
I am the bread of life. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Come to me and never be hungry. Come to me, believe in me, and never be thirsty. The gifts of God or the people of God.
salvation. Holy God, we thank you for this feast of grace and life. As we have been served, help us to serve our neighbors. As we have been fed, help us to feed all who are hungry. As we have been loved, help us to love the world. Because in Christ Jesus, you have loved us. Amen. The hymn is Spirit, Spirit of Gentleness, number 399. It's a bit of a long hymn, friends, so we're going to sing the chorus, then we're going to sing all the verses, and then we'll sing the chorus at the end. Okay?
in the passing of Brother Mark Seal. So, Alina, we pray for you. Let's pray. Lord, bless dear Alina and surround this entire family with your care as they mourn the loss of Mark. Touch them and remind them of your love and care in their lives. Amen. So friends, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God through him. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and in your life, May the Lord give you his peace. Amen.